So my name, I'm Paul Kent Robertson. I'm the, the co-founder of Contagious, um, the intelligence resource and uh, editorial products based in London and New York. Um, looking forward to, to my role here today. Um, as your moderator, I'm going to extract some wisdom and insights from uh, my esteemed panel of experts that we're fortunate um, to have with us today. Um, I'm going to, we, starting from the left onwards, we have um, Yasu Sasaki. So Yasu is head of digital creative and he's the executive creative director of Dentsu Inc. And he's remarkably awake. He served as the uh, jury president of Creative Data Lions here this year. So he's had a lot of time locked in darkened rooms, having to think very carefully about a lot of uh, important campaigns. Next to him is Ted Lim, who's the chief creative officer of Dentsu APAC. He was president of the uh, Direct Lions here in 2017. And finally, we have Ashin Naidu, who is the executive creative director of BWM Dentsu. And he's been serving as a juror on the industry craft lions this week. And he's not wearing sunglasses, so uh, well done. Uh, so the task for this session um, is to explore the ways in which the powerful interplay between data and creativity can generate strong, sustainable value for brands. We're going to try and explore that role that data, media, strategy, creative, and technology plays in business. So we're going to begin with Yasu, okay? So I'm going to give you a very brief introduction um, to him. He's, as I say, he's an ECD, but also a self-professed geek. He's got a background in computer science. Uh, his curiosity has always found a way into writing, digital design, and coding. So he spends a lot of time inventing things uh, in the field of next generation communications. So he joined Dentsu in 1995, which is 24 years, according to my bad maths. Um, he's worked on clients such as Coca-Cola, Google, Honda, Kirin Brewery, Shiseido, and Uniqlo. And he's currently in charge of leading the digital creative teams at Dentsu, developing brand experiences and integrated solutions and leading the innovation teams there. And um, what I like to do sometimes is to find out the secret facts of panelists that you don't necessarily see in their LinkedIn bios and uh, so on. And, and, and Yasu's secret fact is that he's a, a kayaking obsessive, um, often seen to be kayaking along the rivers and oceans in Japan. And in fact, all over the world. I said, what are the most um, obscure places you've been to? One of them was uh, Mongolia. And he's also kayaked the, the Hudson River generally wearing a very cool shirt. Um, and he's traveled along the south end of New Zealand, camping, fishing, and making sashimi for a whole week last year. So, very civilized. So, first question. Um, I know that you feel strongly that um, the data is not just for maximizing business efficiency, but how do you think that data times creativity can generate higher value and enable brands to create strong, sustainable value for, for users, for people? Yes. Um, so a few years, few years ago, data is only used for m marketing, but now data is unlocked. So data is everywhere, and data is really connected to people and culture and future. So if brand and creatives can utilize data in a correct way, so we can create not only marketing activation, but we can create a new service or new culture or new experience, a lot of things, different things. So, yeah. So I think creative data or data and creativity is very, yeah, yeah, interesting area to dig in for Excellent. all the people here. Excellent. Okay. So obviously, you've acted as jury president on Creative Data Lions. Um, I think it'd be interesting um, from an audience point of view just to, to maybe tell us some of the, the, the insights, maybe the trends. What, what did you see um, during your, your active service this week? Yes. Oh, yes. In the jury room, we discuss a lot about the future of data, mm. and I can say seventy percent of entries utilize AIs. So many AIs, many huge data. But at the same time, people are people started to think about the ethics about data. Yes. So not not just stealing data from users, but uh, brands and people are t started think about the right way of using data. So right. that is a very interesting yeah, trend yes. here. 
Okay. Because people get that sense of, of creepiness. Um, right. So that means that they don't trust the brands if they feel they're spying on them and being intrusive without getting something reciprocal back. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, right. yeah, people don't yeah, trust yeah, yeah, the brand because mm. they brand get data from users. Mm. Yes, but now, with a great idea, people started to trust the brand and mm -hmm. people started to provide data mm -hmm. for their better experience. So this is a very interesting trend. This yeah, year. okay, so they want utility and, and so on. So it might be with you, um, I think, taking us through, your, obviously, the, the Grand Prix winner, maybe why it won, why you like it, and I know there's a couple of other campaigns that you felt gave it a very close, uh, strong run against it. So, yeah, uh, yeah let's so dive let's in. see the video. The magic clicker is not full of magic. Okay, there we go. Are we in? Excellent. So, back to Africa. Do you want to maybe explain slightly more show the video? Okay, so, okay. Yeah. So, um, this is a, uh, yeah, let's watch the video first, then I can, yeah, let's video, video let's first. start the video cool. first. Maybe. Twice. In the 400 years since enslaved Thank Africans were first brought to America, <laughs> we've been told to go back. Quote, they should get back on a ship and go back to Africa. That we don't belong. We should go back to Africa where you belong. Go back to Africa! Told by elected officials. Go back to Africa! Told more than once every three minutes online. But what if we could tell a different story about what it means to go back to Africa? This is Go Back to Africa, a pan-African tourism campaign for black and abroad that hijacks real hate as it happens in real time on Twitter, erases the racist context, and displaces it with the positive vision of Africa through hyper-targeted ads for each of Africa's 54 countries. But we had another problem. For black people to want to go to Africa, we need to be able to see ourselves there. And most of the people who appear in mainstream travel imagery are white. So we developed an algorithm that pulls hundreds of thousands of travel images from Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, uses Google Vision AI to find the ones likely to contain black travelers, analyzes and tags the content, and pulls them into GoBackToAfrica.com a first-of-its-kind socially-sourced content platform of aspirational black travel. From Algeria to Zimbabwe. This platform also becomes the foundation for a programmatic influencer marketing campaign. So if one of our millennial targets likes cuisine, adventure, and wildlife, they get a custom ad designed to help them see themselves there. We can't just erase 400 years of hate, but we can take back what it means to go back to Africa. I love that about uh, trolls, white trolls turning into black gold, you know, an amazing insight. Right. So. so now in this digital age, of course there is a lot of useful data, useful information, but at the same time we see a lot of negative information, fake news, hate messages, and this case, so we, yeah, we have to see those, those all kind of information now. But this case did, didn't erase, delete the information, hide, not, not hide the information, but change the hate message into positive, right. uh, positive way yeah. and make uh, black people think about the traveling all over the world. And not just making a marketing success, but it contributes to the culture. So right. data can contribute to culture. It's a very important message yeah. this year. I think creatively as well, it was very yes, well yes. engineered. You had a good fusion of the two. So what was it that, that made you award that the Grand Prix? So. Right, yeah. It's, uh, it's connected to the ethical things. So data, a lot of people started to use data, but the important thing is to use the data in the right way. Mm -hmm. And this case, I believe this case will let people know how to use that in the right way, Excellent. not in the right. bad way. Yeah. Yes, so that's I think, why yeah, we, yeah, we I accepted think this. 
It's a good message for Can Lions 2019 to send out around ethics um, being a you know a, the primary factor when thinking about data and applying it to creativity. Yeah, totally, yes. So I think um, obviously whenever you are in a jury situation, you get inevitable debates about should this win? Who's you know the, the other contenders? So it might be nice to get your thoughts yes, on. Yes, this one is the contender yeah. of the Grand Prix, almost tie, and this is uh, Eva initiative for by Volvo, Volvo, and Volvo provided their safety data for 40 year, more than 40 years to other competitive companies like Toyota or other car companies for free. Yes. So this is a, a, another um, great use of the data for human safety for, in, for the future. So data yes. can create a better future. Yes. Yeah, this was exactly. a great one. So it is an amazing campaign. So, uh, Women are 71% more likely to be injured in a car crash and 17% more likely to die. The reason? Most cars are tested on male crash test dummies. But not at Volvo. They have collected real world data since the 1970s to learn what happens during a collision, regardless of size or gender. What if we could use this data to make all cars safer for women. Introducing the EVA initiative. We collected all of Volvo's research and made it available to everyone in a digital library consisting of data from more than 43,000 collisions and 72,000 people. For the first time ever, anyone could download the research and learn how it has led to some of Volvo's most innovative safety systems. To make the data more human, we gave the numbers a face and created a film that showed how this injustice affects women in a personal and direct way. Eva was introduced at a live streamed event where journalists and competing brands could tune in. The data helped us to understand the mechanism and the importance for all people. And we want the rest of the industry to do the same. Then we launched a global campaign across a wide range of media. The initiative quickly became news and sparked a global conversation about equal road safety. Events of whiplash and injuries like this. But also, they're not just keeping the data for themselves. This uh, data and analysis that they've done is also on their website. So it's open to all car manufacturers to kind of improve safety for women in particular. Very strong. Very strong. Yeah. And then finally, we had the AI versus. Service. Yeah, this is actually this one bronze, not gold, silver, but it is a very interesting, clever way of using AI. Mm -hmm. This is a promotion of a TV station in Russia. And it tells that even AI can be biased by yes. wrong information. Right. So it's, okay. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, so we'll please it. see you later in your... You can watch office. it later, yeah. Well, I love, though, as a, a jury president, you can show the democratic approach that he took, that one of his favourite ideas, he allowed it to settle for a bronze. So well done. Okay. So just, final question, just in terms of... You look at the, the EVA and, and of Africa. So where do you think this category is going? So like in terms of the, the, the future message for, for maybe next year? Yeah, so, yeah, as I said, data is not only for marketing, but data and proper combination, beautiful collaboration between data and creativity can even change the future. Excellent. So, yeah, so I would like to invite more creative people in data industry to come up with a great solution for the industry or for, for the society. Excellent, great, good. Thank you very much, Thank Yasu, you. some really in interesting insights there. Thank you. A round of applause for Yasu, please. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so next we move on to Ted Lim. As I say, he's Chief Creative Officer of Dentsu APAC. He is an English literature uh, graduate, um, and he's now working across 26 offices in 15 countries. Recently repositioned Dentsu Asia Pacific as an innovative business solutions network. So moving beyond advertising to produce non-traditional work in the mobile, digital and social space. I think we were talking earlier, he believes in that we're in the business formerly known as advertising. 
Um, he's saying that working in this digital economy requires a creative strategy that is more relevant and personalized to make the human connection necessary um, for business transaction. And I think from a, a contagious perspective, the, the, the initiative that really sort of caught our eye was taking this, this sort of concept of a strategic support unit um, from Dentsu Tokyo and remodeling it into a specialized business solutions network for mothers by Mothers, um, launched as Mamalab um, Asia Pacific, so well worth a look at Mamalab, um, even uh, popped up on the, the BBC News, uh, looking at that sort of huge potential of marketing to the, the, the mom economy, um, and it's also won projects now for Nestle, Wyeth, and Johnson and & Johnson. So Ted's emails to his team typically end with two words, keep pushing, so which perhaps explains why Dentsu was crowned campaign briefs Agency, uh, Asia's most creative network and AdFest Network of the Year in 2017 and 2018. Okay. So Ted's secret off LinkedIn fact um, is that his family is full of doctors. He has three in England, two in Malaysia, and one in Singapore. His eldest son is a doctor, and his younger son is studying medicine. Ted failed chemistry, which explains why he works in the advertising industry. So, <laughs> so welcome, Ted. So um, first question, I'm thinking of your um, sort of keep pushing philosophy. Um, so I'm going to challenge you today to share your thoughts on how well you think the marketing industry is doing at harnessing the potential of data, media, strategy, creative and technology in driving business performance. So are we narrowing the gap between the potential of what we're starting to see here and the reality? And if so, what could we be doing better? Uh, well, so I certainly think we are narrowing that gap and we are doing it better every year. Um, it was two years ago uh, when I was jury president of uh, the direct category. We're seeing more and more work in what I call direct digital. Now, this thing that we hold in our hands every day it's more inseparable than our husbands and wives. Uh, this is direct digital. And um, some of the work that we have seen um, this year, some of the work that we have seen in the last few years, testify to the fact that direct digital is not only invading our lives, it is the future of our business. Okay. So... Uh, all right, yes. So I put together a few slides. I'm sorry for this because um, I had a few presentations to make uh, in Cannes over the last few days. And I was afraid that I would confuse this with that. So, um, and given my state of mind and lack of sleep, I've, I've put this together. So everyone has been asking, especially those people in the creative business who, uh, who feel that they may be turned into dinosaurs, uh, my personal email address is tetsaurus at gmail.com. There you go, there's a clicker. Ah, sorry. Magic clicker. Um, to the right, yeah? Yeah, the green one. Right, to the green one. Good. Um, so data is a new currency. And what is creativity? Is that important anymore? And uh, here's my point of view. My job is to simplify, put things in perspective. And I think data is critical. It's essential for effective reach. It informs our media and our creative strategy, without which we will be shooting blind. Um, now, but then there's a challenge. We, as a business, we don't have more data or better data than Google or Facebook. Um, and if we are operating in China, Baidu and WeChat won't even sell us their data. So how, how, do, how do we get ahead in this game uh, in a situation like this? So what really is our competitive advantage? Um, I was at the then Global Leadership Conference um, in Amsterdam a few months ago, and we invited a very big client of ours on stage. And this was what she said. There is little to differentiate you, meaning us, from our competition. And that troubled me. I think that troubled everyone in the room and that got me thinking, so how the hell do we differentiate? How do we put ourselves out there as being better and being able to bring value to the table beyond what is seen as parity? So, an acknowledgement, data helps 
us reach the right people at the right time. It is a must-have now. It is a hygiene factor. However, it is not a differentiating factor. Creativity moves the people data has helped us reach. Now, this is the differentiating factor. This moves people, this moves business. Um, I'll give an example. This was done, I think, a couple of years ago in, um, uh, in Shanghai, in China. Do I just click the, yes, again. the green pill? Yeah, the All right, the green pill. Oh, no. So it doesn't go. All right. Send me an email. I'll send you the video. 50 pounds. All right. So in any case, I can tell you what this is about. Um, so you know, China has a huge pollution problem, but the uh, the pollution index changes from time to time, from city to city. So what we have, what we did was we got hold of the data, and uh, depending on the air pollution index, the higher it is, the bigger the discount we give on this mask, right? Um, because we know we will sell more. And uh, once you grab the coupon, uh, you, it will link you to an online website that you can order and you can buy this. So it's relevant, right place, right time, right people, right opportunity, and uh, most important of all, direct digital in the palm of your hands. So in a nutshell, to put everything in perspective, this is how I see it. Data tells us where the customer is. Media gets us there. But what we do when we are face to face with the customer, that is creative. So when, I'm, when, when you're there at the doorstep, what do you do? What do we do? Do we smile? Do we sing a song? Do we bring chocolates? Do we bring alcohol? I mean, um, that person could slam the door in our face and ask us to bug off. Um, so that is the moment of truth, and that is where creativity makes the difference. Um, and when we put the two together, data giving us the right reach and creativity, creativity um, the power of persuasion, that brings us the money. And how, how much would you weight creativity in that equation? You know, equal partners or does creativity have a disproportionate value in that? So, so actually I've simplified this. It's, it goes beyond data and creativity. There's data, there's strategy, there's media, creativity, there's technology. And, um, and people have always been trying to make us choose between this or that. Uh, but in reality, it is this and that. Um, and I wouldn't put one above the other because if you don't have the right data, mm. the best creativity will be wasted. It's yes. wine on sowing wine to swine, <laughs> right? And then if you have the best data, but it is parity and you do not have a cut through message, then all the money you spend on data goes to waste. So equally important. Okay, and obviously you've been here as a, as a, as a delegate this year. Um, what's the sort of the favorite campaign or most provocative idea that you've seen this week? So, um, lots actually, um, but in the, in the space of direct digital, I would say uh, Whopper Detour uh, from Burger King. Um, it is so, it's such a simple thing and uh, there will be questions as to, right, so you've tracked your customers or your would-be customers so why don't you just send them a coupon and they go to Burger King and it's done, it's simple. It's, uh, it's simple, it's not controversial, it's easy. But what they did was they drove these would-be customers to McDonald's in order to get that coupon. So why go to all the trouble and why stir shit with <laughs> McDonald's, right? who's like only like 100 million times bigger than Burger King? Um, that's to generate top value. And when you have top value, you create you create discussion on social media and that multiplies your reach and that multiplies your appeal as well. Um, and, and that's where, and this is, that's the beauty of data and creativity yes. coming together. Yeah. It's the perfect marriage. Absolutely. And I think also for those that may not have seen the campaign, the coupon value was that if you were in a McDonald's because it was geofence, they recognized it, the app would unlock the coupon to send you to the nearest Burger King where you could buy a burger for one cent. 
So I think that justified the logic in people's minds. They felt it was that was why they had to basically put some effort in. But it also shows that people love a challenge. They love interacting when they're getting a reward and it feels, it feels provocative as well as useful for them. Yeah. So again, that's where the creativity kicks in. Totally. So, good. Yeah. And it's kind of quite exciting being a challenger brand as well in that space. It gives you a bit more latitude to, to be brave and do stuff like that. So uh, yeah, good choice. Okay. Thank you, Ted, for your Thank time. You. Okay. Round of applause for Ted. Thank you. Okay, we move on to, to Ash, uh, as I say, the Executive Creative Director at BWM Dentsu in Australia. So he's worked uh, across the industry for, oh, yes, thank you, <laughs> for 20 years um, across South Africa, Singapore, New York, and now Australia. Uh, he's a multi-award winning um, ECD under whose leadership BWM Dentsu Sydney has been rated the ninth most creative agency globally um, in the, the most recent WALK rankings. It's his love of ideas that gets um, him up in the morning. That and his two gorgeous daughters that he told me are suddenly currently in the why daddy phase at the moment, which is quite an interesting space to be for a creative. Um, and when I asked for his secret fact, he said his, <laughs> the thing that instantly came to his mind was that he loved watching tennis as a child. Um, and he had this amazing, interesting experience as an adult in New York sitting next to John McEnroe in a very crowded restaurant. John McEnroe was wearing leather trousers, which is weird in itself, but swore like a trooper. And I think Ash was quite relieved that his, his, his hero, his anti-hero, um, who had lots of tantrums on the tennis court, was just the same in real life in a New York restaurant. It's and what did you do? <laughs> you phoned your dad. I called my dad immediately <laughs> because we used to watch tennis together and we loved, we didn't really love John McEnroe, but we were entertained by John McEnroe. Exactly. But just to have him swear so close to my ears was just like heaven. <laughs> exactly. So sometimes do meet your heroes, it's worth it, or anti-heroes. So um, what we've brought Ash in uh, today for is that a campaign very close to his heart is um, last year's groundbreaking and utterly compelling project revoice for the ALS Association. Um, it was ranked the third most awarded idea globally. Um, it made me cry, I'm not afraid to admit. Um, and here in Cannes, it was a winner of a, a gold lion for creative data and the Grand Prix for good. And it also picked up a very coveted and rare black pencil at DNAD for creative use of technology. So we're going to show you a little clip, um, but just to remind you, it used kind of breakthroughs in voice technology to synthesize and fully kind of recreate the unique essence of someone's voice. So thereby building a complete, complete digital voice clone to ensure that people who suffer from degenerative diseases such as motor neuron will never have to lose their voice to a machine. So if we remind ourselves about how impactful that video was first, and then we'll get Ash's insights into it. One of the hardest things about ALS is losing the ability to speak. I don't want to sound like a computer. I want to sound like me. Time to say goodbye to this computerized voice. It's a strange feeling saying your first words a second time. It's like you don't even realize how powerful, how personal, and just how unique your voice really is until it's taken from you. Guess who's back, bitches? <laughs> Guess who's back, back, bitches? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> brilliant. Um, so I'm gonna. I've got two parts of this question. So um, I think you know you believe in the power of collaboration and, and creativity to solve real business and strategic problems, and in so doing, make a tangible difference to people's lives. So let's get your kind of inside perspective on Project Revoice. I think we've all said it. Contagious. Like award show case studies are great. They're very you know it's compelling, but they're a bit like the swan on the lake. They're beautifully packaged. Sometimes a little bit, um, you know, <laughs> surreal with the truth or whatever. So it'd be good to get the, the, the legs of the swan, like, you know, the, the blood, sweat and the tears, the insights, how you got the idea, the gnarly kind of problems in the first place. So we'll get your, your insight into it. And then obviously all these months and weeks and awards later, what has the project taught you, you know, to, and how can you apply that to real brand problems in the real world that have to kind of sell products and engage audiences? 
Um, I'll start off by apologizing. I, I'm from South Africa, so I say data, not data. <laughs> we just had a big discussion about what's right, and so yeah, I'll be saying data because I'm more comfortable with it. Um, so what was really interesting for us in Project Revoice was that it was this intersection of um, data, uh, technology, and creativity. And weirdly, it didn't start off with a data element in it. As a creative agency, we're always trying to stay on top of the latest trends in the tech world. And about two and a half years ago, there was a lot of uh, work being done in the voice tech space with Google, uh, Google Home and Amazon Alexa. And it was all for sort of commercial purposes, nothing for, for really for good. And one of the teams had this idea, what if we use voice technology to actually give someone their voice back? And we thought, that sounds brilliant and amazing. Um, and we immediately thought of ALS because of the Ice Bucket Challenge, which happened uh, about, I think about seven years ago. Yes. And they actually won uh, a Grand Prix for good for the Ice Bucket Challenge here at Cannes. And that was the founder of ALS yes. in the video. Yeah. And so we thought about it because it raised so much awareness about ALS and how debilitating it is and how you lose control of your body. But one of the things about ALS is that you also lose your voice. And digging a little deeper, we realized that Pat Quinn, who was the co-founder of the Ice Bucket Challenge, had sadly lost his voice. So we went to the ALS with a very simple idea. How do we give the voice, uh, the man who gave a, uh, ALS a voice, his voice back? Uh, and they loved it. And then it became about how we do it. And the problem was that uh, Pat hadn't actually backed up his voice at all. So he had been given the option to, to record his voice and sort of save it in the bank, but he he hated uh, the thought of, um, you know, he hated the thought of machine voices, and he, it just wasn't something he was keen to do. Um, so the challenge was how do we sort of get the voice or the data to actually input into an algorithm? And so fortunately, because he was the voice of the ALS, he had done hundreds of interviews. So our challenge became trawling through YouTube and old TV interviews and trying to extract that data, all those voice samples, from past interviews. And it was quite an intensive process because we had to clean it up to cut out all the background noise. But then the algorithm we used with Lyrebird was very specific. So we had to input very specific words in an order in order for it to create a clone of his voice. And so it became about the challenge of creating this very specific script with uh, voice samples from a variety of interviews. Um, and that's where I think, you know, that data used in a really interesting way can lead to something for good. So um, I guess from our point of view, data came into the piece and actually saved the whole project and became the heart of it. Uh, when we didn't intend to use it initially, we, we didn't think we'd have to go that far, but it made it so much better. Uh, so it was that intersection of uh, creativity, technology, and data that really helped this project come to life. Absolutely. And you're kind of the learnings that you've then taken for your clients in the in the commercial world. Yeah, I mean, you know, when you think about um, uh, data, you, you tend to think about programmatic and targeting, and as Yasu was saying, in a very marketing perspective. But I think what brands are doing more and more these days, and you notice it a lot at Cannes, is like, how can you use creativity to make the world a better place, to, to reach customers and do something in a social purpose uh, that gets you PR, but also helps build your brand? Um, and this was a great example of how those three worlds can come together well. Uh, as an agency, it basically thought, taught us that anything is possible. The fact that you can give somebody their voice back, and now thousands of people are saving their voices. Whenever somebody has a crazy idea in our agency now, nobody says, oh, no, you can't do that. Everybody says, well, we gave somebody their voice back, so we can do anything. So it's Absolutely. really given us confidence as an agency going Excellent. forward. Great. And how does he pronounce data? How did that? How does he pronounce data? Is it data or data? He's American, so he says data. <laughs> yes, okay. yeah, he's happy with that. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. I think uh, we deliberately structured this so that everyone had uh, sufficient time to talk. Uh, and I know it's time for the next session. Um, so I just want to thank our three panelists for uh, sharing their insights and wisdom with us today. Thank you, guys. Thank you.